I ran a data platform team at a late stage uh, freight technology startup called Convoy. I was a tech lead on the artificial intelligence platform team at Microsoft, which uh, not too many people knew about until uh, roughly a year ago, and now everyone knows about it. Uh, and then I've led data engineering teams, data science teams. I've been an analyst, data scientist, so a little, little bit of everything. I'm also an uh, upcoming O'Reilly author, so that's my plug for the book. In about six or seven months, there'll be a new O'Reilly book out called Data Contracts. Check that out. Um, yeah, so I, first part of this presentation, I'm probably not going to tell you guys anything you don't know already. It's going to seem very obvious. So we're going to work our way down to some of the non-obvious and interesting things. Uh, number one is, is this, right? Businesses have huge amounts of data. They're bringing it from many different locations. And yet, a, only a small percentage of it is actually driving meaningful value at their company. Uh, this is a, a, a pretty big problem. Uh, and I think there's a few reasons for it, but one of those reasons is in order to build a data product, which is some data asset that's actually generating meaningful value for the company, it requires answering a whole host of questions first. And if you don't have those questions answered, then it's going to take too much time to build the data products that add value. So let's go through what some of those questions might be. So if you're a data consumer, and by a data consumer I mean someone who is leveraging data to ultimately build the data product, they will have questions like, where is the source of truth for the data that I need? And by source of truth, I do not mean a table in Snowflake or in Databricks or in Vertica or whatever it is that you're using, but what is the operational system from which the actual source data is being leveraged and how can I find that and how can I trust it? Number two, how do I actually get access to this source data? Number three, is it stable? Meaning if I take a dependency on that data, if I start to use it in my machine learning model, is it all of a sudden going to change out from under my feet? Or will it be consistent from day to day? If there are problems with the data that I'm using, will they be fixed quickly? And then finally, is there someone who's accountable for this data? And does this accountable person treat the data as a product? And I find that in many businesses, these questions are not answered, and that makes building data products very hard. But this is only half of the equation. There's actually another set of questions from a different set of stakeholders that needs to be answered as well, which are the data producers. Data producers can be anyone that are generating data. That might be a software engineer working in an application. It might be a salesperson working within Salesforce. It might be someone on the operations team inputting manual data into Excel spreadsheets. And they have their own set of questions that require that are required for them to take ownership over their data. Like, who is actually using this? What are they using it for? Uh, why is it important? Are they using it the way that it is intended to be used? When do new dependencies exist? And who are the people I should be talking to about these dependencies? When changes happen, what gets impacted? And then finally, do I actually need to be accountable for this data, yes or no? So if these questions are not answered, then it is almost impossible for the producers to say, yes, I will be an owner of this data set, and I will contribute to, keep to treating it as a product. So why is getting the answers to these questions a difficult thing? Well, I think there's three parts to it. Part number one, over time, data ecosystems just become crusty. It's the way of the world, right? You start with one relatively small table, then people begin to add more columns to it over time. It's not always clear who these people are that are adding these columns. The lineage graph comes very complex and messy. Second, you have a ton of replication. And oftentimes, replication happens because of problem number one. So if I'm a data scientist, and I'm trying to build a machine learning model, and I need to trust the outputs of that model, am I going to take a dependency on this huge table that nobody owns, and I don't even know what the meaning of the underlying data is? No, I'm going to go back to the source. I'm going to figure out what the source of truth is. I'm going to build a new query that meets my purpose, and then I'm going to create my machine learning model. A change then happens. It breaks my table, and then the next person who wants to do the same thing repeats the process, and now you have infinite duplication. And that leads us to the third problem, which is constant change, especially in software engineering-driven organizations where there's always new applications being built every single day, new features being launched, new data being generated. It's just constant change. And if you have no change management system in place, 
changes happen, things break, we don't trust our data anymore, and the whole process begins all over again. So a lot of people imagine that as their use cases for data grow, it's pretty easy to add more resourcing to their existing data team to keep up with the demand, but it actually does not scale linearly. Because the complexity increases exponentially over time, that means the cost to manage the data rises at a rate that outpaces any possible resourcing. And so you quickly get into a situation where your data team is just constantly underwater with these issues. Data engineering is constantly building new pipelines, addressing outages, and that's really all they're doing instead of truly innovating. So some of the things that come from that, some of the problems, number one, you start to get a huge garbage in, garbage out problem, right? The data is low quality coming in from the source systems, and that makes it very difficult to use. And because it's very difficult to use and hard to trust, it leads to a lack of innovation velocity because it starts taking way more time to validate that the data is correct. And now you're spending the majority of your time on validation and not on, on building. And ultimately that produces a lack of trust in the data. And if your team doesn't trust the data, then they use it less often. So data management is all about solving these problems, right? This is what the field of data management is for. It is all about data quality, data compliance, data security, data governance. However, I think there's a problem when we talk about modern data management. And I think everybody in this room, I'm probably preaching to the choir, thinks very heavily about things like governance and data catalogs and ETL and transformation. And that's like really great, but that's usually within our scope as data professionals. And our scope of data professionals is typically limited to what is downstream within the data warehouse or analytical environment. But this only represents 50% of the data supply chain. And when I say data supply chain, what I mean is that in the software engineering world, you can be completely decoupled. You can have an application team that's kind of building their own stuff over here, and they don't really work that much with the other application team who are building their own stuff. But in data, that, that cannot possibly be true, right? Like we take very hard dependencies every time a new query is written. If I've got a metric called profit, then I have to take a dependency on the teams that are producing the revenue metric and the cost metric, and the revenue teams have to take a dependency on everyone who, who is providing an input to each purchase, and they themselves have their own dependencies. So it's a supply chain, and each step of the supply chain has a responsibility. And if all of these data management best practices are not present on the upstream, then definitionally, you will get data quality issues that flow downstream. So this is a term that is starting to be used at some of the more tech forward companies in the world, some of the big uh, tech forward banks, as an example, which is federated data management, which is how can we start to apply data management to both the upstream systems and the downstream systems in a way that is standardized and automated. Uh, but this is hard, which is why you don't see it done that often. And the reason it's hard is because the production of data, so the data producers, are distributed. Many teams, many different technologies, uh, super heterogeneous environments. Every company has a different set of sources, and that makes standardization really, really hard. But data consumption is centralized, meaning we're forcing kind of all the data into one place. And that one place might be a data lake like S3, it might be Snowflake, it might be something like Trino. Um, this is definitionally a bottleneck, right? That is what a bottleneck is. If you have lots of source systems and not very many consumers, then you will start to put pressure on the teams that are managing that bottleneck, which are typically data engineers or data platform teams. So how do teams generally respond to this? Well, number one, a lack of change management often means that your data engineers are not heroes within your organization. Teams are always going to them and saying, hey, something is wrong. And the data engineers are not going to them and saying, hey, here's all the value that I've created for you. Lots of code refactors. So this is a bit of like, you know, if all you have is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. When things start to not go very well, the default might be, well, we need to completely rebuild our data warehouse. Well, the issue isn't with the data warehouse. The data warehouse is fine. The issue is that there is no management or governance with the source systems. It causes your data to fail and break. Teams then sort of do what is locally effective for them, and that creates
create chaos in your data warehouse. And then three, you often see standardization failures, which is we're going to our producers and we're asking them to do things a certain way. We're trying to get them to follow certain policies. Generally, this is just not possible. It doesn't work unless it's programmatic. So partial data management solutions require massive human activation energy. It is very cost sensitive, very time consuming to roll out even one of these sort of end-to-end -end processes for a single source system. So this is just an example of what the workflow typically looks like, right? We've, we've added a new feature in the company. The software engineering or producer team say everything's okay, passes all their quality checks. Maybe we have some monitors, but then somewhere, someone who's looking at a dashboard, hopefully not the CFO of the company, notices that there's an issue. They say, hey, can you fix this? This gets escalated to the data team. Data team scrambles, tries to figure out what's going on. Eventually, after lots of root, ca root causing, they realize it came from the source. They go and talk to whoever tried to make the change. It turns out that the team is now working on something totally different. They say, hey, we'll get to your problem in three weeks, you know, as soon as we can, maybe a month. Goes onto the backlog. Eventually, they put out a solution, merge the PR. We have to do a backfill, and then finally, we tell people that the problem has resolved. This has been weeks, if not months, and it severely impacts trust. So a few use cases of this happening um, that, I, that just sort of illustrate the point. One is usage-based pricing at New Relic. Uh, the New Relic team does all of their sort of financials based on event data coming from their app. Anytime a software engineer made a change to that event data, it would cause a nightmare for the sales team uh, and the finance team. Uh, Subzero is a refrigeration company. Um, there's a story they were telling me where they had a transactional database that stored the serialization number of each refrigerator. An engineer decided to unknowingly change that number from a six character string to a seven character string. That number then got printed out as a barcode for every single refrigerator. Thousands of these were shipped to their customers and they had to do a manual recall. And then at Convoy, the company where I work, we had very large scale machine learning models there were changes coming all the time from source that caused chaos for our data team and prevented us from moving quickly. So from an architecture perspective, this is essentially what I'm talking about, right? So two sides to this graph. On the right side of the graph is the downstream. You've got Snowflake, Databricks, BigQuery, Redshift, um, DBT, Fivetran, all of your cool tools for moving data and doing analytics. And on the left, you have the source system, right? Your app uh, clickstream data, Kafka, um, you know, your server logs. And at the top, you see all the data management tools we have available. We have Calibra and Atlin for cataloging. We've got data quality and testing and Monte Carlo for observability. And on the left, we have nothing. This is obviously a problem. So federated data management is all about bringing the producer into the data management lifecycle and not excluding them from the process and only focusing on the downstream data team. So I call this Dev Data Ops, which may sound like a mouthful, but this has some precedent in the world. There's a term called DevSecOps, and DevSecOps uh, sort of came about around five to seven years ago from security engineering teams who were really tired with dealing with security incidents after the fact, right? The business gets hacked, you just deal with it. There's fraud, and now we just deal with it. They said, we can actually prevent these things from happening in the first place, but we need to integrate security best practices into our engineering pipelines and workflows. So there's a few components of Dev Data Ops. It follows a very similar pattern. Let's take everything that we know about data management, everything we're doing downstream, and start to move it upstream. Data contracts are a big part of that. These are APIs, interfaces that are agreed upon between producers of data and consumers of data. The same way we have APIs for all of our software applications, we probably also need some type of interfaces for the data that we rely on as well. Uh, we have code review for data. So in the same way that software engineering teams, they have a PR and some software engineer looks at the code and says, this makes sense. If we're making a code change that is going to affect data, we should have data teams reviewing those and understanding how it's going to impact the rest of the organization. Unit testing, integration testing, everything that we have learned about DevOps in the last 20 years, I believe, needs to be incorporated into the data workflow as well. So the data contract is a big part of this, like I just said. Um, a lot of people hear contract and they think that it's very, very rigid and it doesn't change and we're signing, you know, signing your name and blood on a piece of paper. But in my mind, it's all about understanding how changes happen at an organization in the same way that an API does. So it just represents the current state of the data 
that consumers will expect is composed of a few things. Uh, number one is the, the schema, so the structure of the data. And then number two is the contents of the data itself. So this would be your SLAs, your data quality rules, things like this. So in order to implement dev data ops and data contracts, this is a, a really important point, I think, which is that it's not going to work to go to your producer and say, hey, I want you to start managing data the same way that my team as a data org manages data. Right? Software engineers are, and, and data producers and salespeople are not data teams. They don't work with tables. They don't work with DBT. They don't work with Fivetran. They don't work with sort of all these tools that we're very used to. They work with Git and Terraform and Kafka and S3. This is their home. And so in order for this to work, the systems have to make sense for the workflows that they already use. So here's an example of that happening just to illustrate my point where within the actual Git workflow, a software engineer is making a change to an event. That event produces data that is pushed into S3 and is ultimately consumed in many reports and analytics applications downstream. When they are making the change, the data contract does a check at the data on the data. It says, does the data look the same way that we expect it to look uh, after this PR versus before this PR? And if the answer is no, then you run an integration test you prevent that change from deploying, and you contact everyone who would be affected by that change. So ultimately, each person in the data supply chain now has a responsibility. The data producer is aware of who they are impacting downstream. They can see this. It's visible. The data engineer can reach out, and they can either prepare the downstream teams for the change or prepare their own pipelines. And the data consumer can self-advocate, right? So they can be told, hey, analysts, your dashboard is about to get blown up by a change coming from production, you should probably prepare yourself for that. So I think there is a maturity curve for this type of thing. Not everyone is ready for this level of sophistication. Um, level one is kind of like setting up your data foundation, just getting you know, Snowflake in place, Databricks in place, getting sort of process. Two is starting to understand, like, can we understand on the downstream side what's happening, what's changing in our data? And then number three is starting to push more upstream. So my belief here is that it's actually visibility that drives culture change. And ultimately, that is what we are talking about, culture change. How can we help the culture of data producers begin to become more aware of their consumers and how data is leveraged in the business? And I think the only real way to do this is to help both sides understand how they're impacting each other and to provide some level of accountability through that visibility. Right? So if you're telling a producer, hey, if this change happens, you're going to cause untold amounts of damage for your consumers, then they now have to make a choice. And the choice is either I will make the change anyway, and I will break everyone leveraging this data, or I will have a conversation with them. And ultimately, that's what we really care about. Uh, so here's sort of a short list of all the companies that are beginning this shift left, as we call it, pushing uh, governance and data management towards the data producers and data contracts. Uh, obviously, you can see it's a, it's a pretty wide group from banks, tech companies, media companies. Um, actually, I, I've probably spoken to around 2,000 companies that are beginning this approach. I think we're really going to see it play out a lot over the next five to ten years. Uh, but it's super, super exciting, and I'm happy to talk about it more. Uh, come and find me after the presentation. That's it. I'm done.